This podcast ponders how we will live in this COVID era. What's on the horizon? What should we expect? Where are the opportunities? We explore the what's next in the next normal. Lisa Taylor, president of Challenge Factory. The reason every decision we go to make is so difficult is because it's laden with moral hazard. We can't actually judge what's good and bad. Dave Hardy, president of Hardy Stevenson and Associates. COVID has really pushed us to think about what healthy cities mean. Sarah Thorne, president and CEO at Decision Partners. We've really acknowledged the recognition and the safety and the caring for each other because we've adopted these new behaviors. Ujwal R. Colgood, chief anthropologist and CEO at Motive Base. And this is not just because of the pandemic, this is because a lot of us have gained new knowledge. Well, here we find ourselves, the final episode of this season of The Next Normal. Thanks for joining us. I'm Aaron Trafford. I'm Dave Trafford. And what I would suggest to you is that if this is the first one you've listened to, go back, start at one. You don't have to listen to them in order, but there is a whole lot of conversation that's gone on over the last Gee, it's been 12 weeks Mm -hmm. and, um, you know, we're, we're finishing off not with an ending though. I think the idea is that we we're talking quite literally about broadening our peripheral vision and our understanding of how we're going to live in the next generation, not just in the next two or three months because of our collective experience with the COVID pandemic. I think the question that we're really posing to put a cap on this season is where were the bright spots, A, because there were bright spots, but also what, yeah, to your point, what opportunity does that open up to fill the gaps that we can now see in places like our education system and our innovation markets? Like, what do those bright spots mean for our future? And I think Sarah Thorne leads the charge on this episode, and she really digs into um, how can we not not look at this as all kind of making lemonade out of lemons, but where is the silver lining here? And how can we continue to foster that, to your point, generationally? When I think about our previous conversations, I want to focus on creativity and lifelong learning and risk-taking. And risk-taking, which we talked about, is necessary for innovation. But I also want to talk about inclusion and empowerment and how do we come together in co-creating our future, our, our collective next normal. And as I was putting my thoughts together, I thought, really, I've got a lot of questions for my brilliant co-hosts. So I'm going to lead off with some questions. I want us to think about what can we learn from our pandemic experience that we can take forward with clear purpose to work collaboratively to tackle the big issues. We got to tackle things like climate change, which we were talking about, food and water security, health equity. How do we build from what we've learned and think outside the box, create better, more holistic system solutions? We really need to enable and encourage system thinking because Certainly the pandemic has taught us that all of these things are interconnected. Mother Nature has been telling us that for years, and now we have to really pay attention to climate change, which is upon us. So what have we learned about creativity and innovation that's going to help us become more resilient, and I dare say, more mindful in the decisions and the actions that we take? And how do we engage the next generation? Lisa, why don't we start with you? Yeah, I think the creative approach is the right one. In the last episode, we talked about how education has moved with some programs becoming more integrated. And I think that concept, what it opens up is that the things that used to go together now maybe don't go together as well, or maybe there's new possibilities, art and medicine, you know, science and business. There's all kinds of ways for us to break down the barriers of not just how we think about what we learn, but the work that we do. And who's on whose team, and who's making the choices that they want to make. I've been working with an organization that has said, you know, everyone in my group can work independently. They don't actually have to work together in order to accomplish the goals that they have. Do I have a team? It's a really interesting concept. And I guess the thought of, you know, what relationship do we all want to have to each other? Coming back to one of the big questions that we asked, but I don't know that we actually ever fully answered it in an earlier uh, episode, what workplace do we want our grandchildren to 
uh, inherit? What are the conditions that we want them to be working in? What does it mean to have all of these things continue to evolve? We start by really analyzing what is it that we actually want in our own lives today for a better world, for a better company, for a better industry, for a better country, for a better street, for a better household, for a better family at every level from the highest global level to me as an individual, what actually is it that I want? And then where can I go get all of the different pieces to bring things together in new ways that maybe hasn't been considered before or others haven't put it together in that way and that's okay for them, I'm gonna craft my own path for myself. We're seeing possibility to do this more and more and more and I think we need to celebrate and encourage it. Lisa, let me just ask you that question though in a different way because, um, and I realize that, that it's important for me to look at this and say, uh, okay, be self-aware, let's look at what it is we really need and we really value. But what kind of, I'm going to have a conversation with my granddaughter this week. How much should she be involved in this conversation? I realize she's only a five-year-old, but she's got a broader and a more active imagination than anybody I know. So at what level do we need to include that? I'm not being, I'm not being, I don't think, uh, naive here. I think that that needs to be part of the conversation. If we're going to say, what kind of workplace do we want for our grandchildren? We need to be sensitive to how it is they view the world already, even through the eyes of a five-year-old. Yeah, there's a, a concept of, you know, nothing for us without us. It, it starts within certain demographic groups and certain disadvantaged populations. It says don't create programs for us without including us. And we can certainly apply that to an age lens as well. Now, is your granddaughter going to come up with the organizational design and the products and services of the future in your conversation? She's not. But what you're going to be doing by facilitating that conversation with her is helping to establish in her the curiosity, the real benefit of her thinking that people are taking her seriously, that she has something to contribute to. And the questions that you ask about how she considers what's happening around her at an age appropriate level is you activating career development at the youngest ages. And that's where it starts. So the conversation with your granddaughter is not so much about what's the quality of input that you're going or in, uh, of answer that you're going to get from her about the workplace of the future, but it's you saying the workplace of the future that I want my granddaughter to be in is one where she knows she has worth and value and intelligence and can make choices. And you're starting her on that path by modeling that with her on the weekend. And I think that's a phenomenal thing. Dave Hardy, I can only imagine what the focus group would look like for you planning the communities of the future with a round table of five-year-olds. Well, actually, I indeed, I had a conversation with my 11-year-old granddaughter this weekend, first time in two years. She actually stayed over. We had a nice, she's a very thoughtful young person. We had a long conversation, but I found that halfway through the conversation, I had been canceled. Um, and I said, why are you canceling me? She says, because you're not saying the things you need to say that, that, that I've learned. And I go, okay, it's a <laughs> first time I was canceled. But, you know, I, when I bring new people into our firm, uh, and sometimes I, talk, I give uh, opening talks to uh, grad students at universities, and I, I tell them, look, first of all, value everything that you learn it's all going to be used in your in your work life. Second, learn as much technical information as you can as a skill, but your employer is going to retrain you anyways. It's it's really the um, the experience and the values and the work ethic that I'm looking for in, in employers. But that experience, too, I think my co-hosts here, uh, I agree. Having that broad view, being multidisciplinary, that's really important. And I think it will be in the future. So, Ujwal, let me take you back to the conversation where you left us and, and and put this in that educational frame and the creativity frame. And I think you kind of jarred me out of my comfort zone when you said, essentially, that we are, should not be in the business of myth busting, which is institutionally what most people want to do. We need to embrace the new myths to learn better lessons. Yeah, <laughs> yeah absolutely. I mean, uh, you know, the one of the things that uh, certainly the many of the large corporations organizations we work with and i think the same is true even of the public sector as well uh, the things people struggle with is a lack of control and 
you know, if you really realize it, and there's a whole field in philosophy that talks about how much little control we have, even over the day-to-day decisions we make. Um, if you really think about it, there is a lot less control than we want uh, to have in the work we do, in the outcomes we expect. And I think, you know, one of the things that we teach when we go into these organizations is to to figure out what are the areas where you don't have control. And one of those areas is how myths, ideas about anything and everything in culture develops. There's very little control over that. And certainly brands cannot dictate that. And certainly politicians cannot dictate that. Um, so then the question becomes, okay, so how, what do we do about it? Do we fight it or do we use it and sort of ride the wave? And I, I use the analogy of, a, of somebody who's learning how to surf for the first time. One of the first things you learn is you can't invent your own wave. You can't go against whatever the tide is. Uh, it's too powerful. You're, it, it'll throw you off and you might drown if you really uh, disrespect the ocean. And it's kind of the same scenario. And, you know, it's, it's a very hard lesson for people to learn, especially for leaders to learn in any field. Uh, but once they start to figure that out, then it, it creates a new approach to how we start to think about these ideas and, and the respect we give to, to myths that we don't agree with or we dislike. And, and that respect is absolutely necessary in order to find a way forward. Sarah, I can almost hear politicians' heads exploding listening to Ushwal because they're saying, okay, I got to go with the flow, but I got to be disruptive at the same time. It really does take us out of our comfort zone, particularly if we talk about, you know, institutions like education. Absolutely. And I think, you know, in in my world of risk and decision making, uncertainty is very uncomfortable for people. Certainty is what we would all like. Um, but we need, we're, we're faced with a lot of uncertainty right now. And I think that we need that dynamic space to be creative and to be innovative. And we're not going to solve the problems of the future by applying the solutions of 20, 30, 40 years ago. Um, one of the things that we've been talking a lot about, Dave, in our engineering with nature podcasts, um, with, um, our army Corps folks is thinking about how we engineer with nature to deal with some of the massive infrastructure requirements the world has now and will have in the future. How do we integrate natural and nature-based solutions? How do we work with nature instead of imposing uh, traditional solutions, bridges, levees, that sort of thing? Um, And how do we do it in a way that we can adapt to climate change and changing conditions. I think it's the same thing with education and policymaking. We need to be thinking about, we need to put on our adaptive management brains and we need to combine it with um, a passion and a commitment to continuous learning because there's there's no check the box solutions. I mean, Dave Hardy's gonna tell you that. He's thinking out 20, 25 years into the future. He can't go back and pull something off the shelf that worked 25 years ago. He's got to be thinking and adapting to the changing conditions. And I think we've got to be a lot more um, respectful about that. And we have to hold our politicians and um, policymakers feet to the fire on those sorts of things. So before we go, I want to do a quick roundtable with each of you. And I, I, and I kind of want to get a sense from you for over the last 12 episodes. W- what is it that we have learned that you think is really the positive and what question does that prompt or what challenge the excitement of, and I, again, I use that positively. Does that pose us an opportunity moving forward? But before we get there, we started this whole series and Ujwal, our good, our cultural anthropologist said, you know, everything has meaning and meaning is currency. Dave Hardy, off of what Sarah has just said and what we were talking about in this one, it occurs to me that creativity now becomes part of the new currency moving forward in the next normal and no more so than in your discipline. I can see where creativity is actually going to be the thing that we should be perhaps valuing most. Yes. uh, We need to open up our minds and and allow that creativity to come in. And I see two areas um, of better coming out of COVID. One is 
uh, senior care, the vulnerable care. Um, we need to do a much better job there. But and, but COVID has shone a light on that, unfortunately. We need to do a much better job at designing our cities. Um, we have vacant office spaces. We need to redesign public spaces and places of gathering. So that has been a result of COVID as well to force us to think, how do we be creative and make that happen? I'll, I'll end with perhaps, Dave, a, a big question I have in my mind, if that's uh, okay with you. Uh, my big question is that, like we saw and we respected our frontline workers, and I dare say I, I've I respect our politicians who have really uh, worked uh, endlessly to help get us through this pandemic. But how do we continue that? How do we learn to better trust each other, to respect our diverse opinions and find common ground and work collaboratively, as Sarah was saying? Those are my points. Ujwal, let's go to you in terms of sort of the, the, the positive thing that we have all embraced and we can see moving forward. And then what, what big question or challenge or opportunity does that present for us? Yeah, I mean, the big thing that I've learned, I think, just going through this series is uh, that the, there is an underlying message of optimism in everything we're talking about. And I think the pandemic has actually made us more optimistic than than the other way around. Uh, the biggest thing for me is no matter what subject we're talking about, we're, there's an underlying theme. We're making room for new thinking. We're making room for new ideas. We're making room for differing opinions. And I think that's an important development uh that benefits everybody. I did want to end on on one uh, note uh, as a reminder, because we've talked a lot about meaning from the perspective of anthropology. And I wanted to give you a stat. More than 70% of how ideas, concepts, things in society and culture are interpreted is implied. So more than 70% of the meaning that something you say so Dave, as an example, you say something, more than 70% of how it's interpreted is implied. Less than 30% is expressed. The reason I, I want to end on this is because the words we use, the way we talk, the language we use is critical, more, more critical than it has ever been before. And it's, I think, to me, the first step is we need to learn and evolve the language we use when we talk to one another. Because the language we use sends a message, sends an implicit and implied message to the world that we are open to dialogue. We are open to new ideas. And I think that's something that's crucial for, uh, for the development of the future. I think we could probably do an entire series on that based on the context of well, how social media functions. I, I, now, I don't want to I don't want to stomp on anything that Lisa or uh, Sarah has to say in terms of, uh, you know, again, lessons learned, Lisa. And where do you see that opening up an opportunity we might not have seen otherwise? I'm going to come to a, a word in a, a different type of meaning to play on meaning a little bit. And I think one of the lessons learned and one of the pieces that I've learned in going through these conversations with my brilliant co-host has been a focus on Zoom. And I don't mean Zoom, the technology that we all use to meet with each other, but Zoom in terms of the level of focus that we put very tight up on a certain topic or very broad. And I think one of the things that we've learned going through COVID is we need to be able to readjust the level of focus that we have all at the same time. We need to focus on our own personal health and safety while also paying attention to societal issues. Certainly one of the things that I'm taking out of our, all of our conversations is we have covered enormous policy topics. We've talked about what the politicians should do. We've talked about broad sweeping change that we may see over the next 10 or 20 years. And a lot of those topics are great for keynote addresses all over the world or for you know, this type of podcast where it's short. But what organizations really need is they need to know how to bring all of these ropes right down to the ground. What do you actually want me to do with all of these pieces? And to the integrated conversation we are having, where do I fit? And how do I start to apply some of this thinking in my everyday job? Practically, what should we do? And I'm going to come back to saying, I think that starts one grandparent to grandchild conversation at a time. And I certainly think in the workplace that starts with one frontline manager to employee at a time. Often with these big topics, we think about broad sweeping policy and what are we going to do at the C-suite. Really, where we need to be learning is what did the frontline manager experience in having to manage day to day with their employees? What have they been hearing? 
What's happening at that grassroots level? And how do we support those managers that are in these challenging conversations with employees every day, often without a line of sight, to everything that's happening around them. It's that grassroots level that I really think we need to take these ideas to and continue to make sure they have practical tools to be able to implement them in their workplace every day. Yeah, Sarah, I think if nothing else, just from my perspective, is that we have learned that the importance of asking the big question and be prepared sometimes not to have the answer right in front of us, but to Lisa's point, the conversation that follows is the critical part of of our development. So to you, what is your, your lesson learned and where's the opportunity you've seen coming out of the last 14 months? Well, I totally agree with everything that our, my co-hosts have said, but I think as I've been listening and thinking about what we've been talking about, what did we learn during the pandemic? A book came to mind and it only just connect. What we learned is about the power of connection. We learned to Dave's point to value the people in our community who are looking after us, the people who were um, working in healthcare, the people who were delivering food, the people that were making producing food. I think that um, we learned about our communities. We learned about people who are vulnerable in our communities, including um, seniors living in um, their own homes who didn't have access to the help that they needed during the pandemic. We've got to do a better job. So. I think that we learned about connection, and I think that we learned a lot about our personal values, which is what we need to really build on going forward. I think we need to be a lot more holistic, inclusive. To Ujwal's point, we need to have have a shared language. We need to have a way of looking at and talking about where we're going and why um, in language that we all understand, and in language that is inclusive and um, doesn't label people or their issues. And the other thing I think that my kind of what's next, I think that we need to, um, from a policy and organizational point of view, I think we have to stop saying this won't work. Uh, Mm -hmm. There's no penalty for saying, you know, no, we can't do that. That won't work. We've tried it. Won't work. I think we have to say we should try it. We need to keep an open mind. We need to bring our multidisciplinary creative thinkers together and solve this together instead of shutting down uh, creativity and innovation. So I love how we kind of finished on this because it felt like a positive note. You know, Mm -hmm. Uh, one of the things just sort of dropped the curtain back a little bit. When we started talking about this series, the, some of the feedback we got was, boy, it, it just sounds so dire. It sounds so negative. And let's face it, we, at the time we started conversations about this series, we were in the middle of the worst wave of the pandemic. So people were feeling that anxiety. I think as this 12 weeks is stretched out, we've seen people kind of walk into the light quite literally and figuratively and look around them and say, okay, here's where I am now. And what my level of resilience that we've achieved, an understanding of what it takes to be resilient, um, and we're better prepared for something like this to happen again. Not that we're wishing for it, but we expect that it will. So that we finished on this note of opportunity, this note of encouraging entrepreneurship and leadership and all the things that we've talked about over the last little while. Um, I think that the, the, the whole service done by the people around the, the table, the round table, is to be able to say, we have the brains, we have the lessons, and let's take it full advantage of everything that we have experienced during the COVID pandemic, because there's an opportunity here for, you know, as Dave, I think he used the phrase, build back better. Mm-hmm. And for me, what I learned over the last 12 episodes, yes, the first few felt really, um, I don't want to say heavy, but we were really in it. We were really kind of looking, what does this mean? What are we experiencing? And of course, when you ask questions like that and you're in the middle of a pandemic, it's going to feel heavy. But what's interesting, you know, you mentioned leadership, entrepreneurship, all of these opportunities. For me, what's standing out is that not only are we 
reevaluating those things, but we are revaluing them now. Mm -hmm. So things like being a leader doesn't mean hustling and working, you know, from 6 a.m. until 9 p.m. every night. Being a leader sometimes means looking at your staff as a human and saying, you know, I think in one of the episodes, how are you doing today? Yeah. It's those yeah. little bits of humanity that I think we have learned to reintegrate into these bigger concepts of being an entrepreneur, of being a leader, of having courage and of innovating. And in some ways, it's a return to the basics that maybe over the last few generations we had forgotten. Well, as we have experienced the pandemic, uh, it, it, typically we want to find some context for the whole thing. Mm -hmm. And often we have been referred back to the world wars where that changed behavior generationally, the depression back in the 20th century. And those are the big moments that changed the way we live generationally. This is where we are right now in many respects. And I think you're right. The folks who lived through the world wars, the folks who lived through the great depression reevaluated their values. There will be people who, you know, we probably still in our lives of, of a certain age who have certain behaviors because they were kids during, you know, the Second World War. And this is how they were brought up. And it's about values. It's about their families. It's about how they approach the world for better or for worse. So it doesn't mean it's all going to be rosy <laughs> moving forward because, you know, we can see people getting into arguments about us and them. And all they're saying is, I'm, you know, clinging to my values. But I think in the long run, the greater good has been that we have all been forced to reevaluate those values. And they've become more important in our lives. I think all of our hosts would agree. So round of applause for them for threading this needle and bringing us, you know, weaving this beautiful story so that we can kind of see where things are going and that bright spot at the end of the tunnel. The Next Normal is sponsored by Challenge Factory, shaping the future of work. By Decision Partners. Our world is a better place when we make better decisions. By Motive Base, decoding implicit meaning behind what people talk about. And by Hardy Stevenson and Associates, planning the cities of the future. Comments, questions, or ideas for our hosts? Feel free to drop us an email at hello at storystudionetwork.com. This series is produced for the Story Studio Network by Eye Contact Productions.